the Holy Spirit. Can we spend a moment exercising our spirits in the Holy Ghost? Stretch yourself, exercise yourself. Jehola sate la brascamba la hai cabo se limande. Bresco fotomena hiko saita kunde baba la hade. Ramanda has cababo sheketale. Ramina kusa se la ude manta la bala. Rai can se li copeto conde babade. Brasketo bonde babisa anahandale. Jama cantelo husketa bradegala. Ambra baba kasuketa li. Yaka conde besa si. Rai takoba manzala. Ebra makasketone. Ekadeli. Salabonda, Abrante Koskete, Abrante Kasama Landoria, Escobe Maliati, Rakosama Alatania, Ela Duscante Mina Alabola, Shamina Casketo, Recotante Basanta Babolia, Eco Selabi, Acasanta Babodema, Ebrasketo Colapata, Abraca Santa Babolia, Abraca Semina, Abraca Babode. Thank you, Father. We give you praise. We give you glory. We say Hosanna. 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 Hosanna to your name. Oh, thank you for lavishing your mercy upon us. When the lion came, he could not take us. When the bear came, he could not overcome us. Have even your uncircumcised Philistine was no match to us. For in you we live, in you we move, and in you we have our very being. Be enthroned afresh, be glorified afresh. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. God bless you. We were trying to define what a sacrifice was yesterday. And in view of the above, I would still like to take us to the book of Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. Let us see a simple scripture that lays out the matter very, very plainly. And it came to pass when Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau his eldest son and said unto him, My son, and he said unto him, Behold, here I am. And he said, Behold, I am old and I know not the day of my death. Now therefore take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out into the field, and take me some venison, venison, sorry, and make me savory meat such as I love, and bring it to me that I may eat, that my soul may bless thee before I die. Can you see that his father was prescribing to him the kind of meat that he needs to make available, such meat that is savory, such that he loves. And when he has dined in this venison, his soul will bless him. 
So when we talk about a sacrifice, we're talking about something that you can present before a spirit being that his soul will love. Something that you can present before a spirit being that he will look upon and be satisfied. Something that will provoke a response from that spirit being to deal with you with tender mercies and with great favor. And the Bible is saying that the priesthood of the New Testament is established to this end to offer up spiritual sacrifices unto God. Are you there? And such sacrifices will be acceptable because it's offered by the promptings of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. I had to go through the entire book of Leviticus. And the reason why I did this was because the champion priest is Moses. And it will be difficult for us to understand the context of priesthood, even as it applies to New Testament reality, if we do not take some time to study um, the, the ministry of Moses and the mysteries that his ministry is downloaded. Are you still with me? Now, through the ministry of Moses, we began to understand such sacrifices that God, our God can accept. His ministry provided a clue that uh, establishes the operating system for all such righteous priesthood because it gives us a lot of window to um, know the kind of sacrifices that will be pleasing in the sight of God. So the book of Leviticus happens to be our manual for this season. We'll take a theological look at it, understand its overview, and we must also note, because I need to present a few scriptures to us in our analysis of the book of Leviticus so that uh, we will transit from information to understanding. I need to give us a few scriptures just to bring us back to the stage of capacity building one more time. Uh, okay, maybe let's do Hebrews chapter 10, beginning from verse number one. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning from verse number one. Now, this is what Apostle Paul says. He said, for the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things. Now, this is an attempt to explain to us that when we travel into the Old Testament and we see the patterns that are established in the Old Testament, um, the interpretation of those patterns in the New Testament is not always going to be in the shape that they are presented in the Old. There are a few adjustments that apply in most cases. You don't take it hook, line, and sinker. Now, he's saying that the Old Testament, this is the purpose that it serves. It is a shadow of things to come. Are you there? It is pointing to things that are yet to come. It is a prophetic drama about things that God wants to do. So, I hope you know sometimes, have you taken a look at your shadow? Do you, do you see your shadow sometimes? I know you don't. When it is 12 noon, try to trace your nose in the shadow. You will discover that the nose you will see in the shadow might be like this. <laughs> you, are not, you are not following me. <laughs> the, you might find a part of your body that is highlighted by, by the shadow in a proportion bigger than the actual image. So if, we, if the Old Testament is a shadow of things to come, that means it is a prophetic pointer pointing to realities that will be obtainable in the future. Are you there? The second thing we need to note is that it is not the very image of the things. It is not the very image of the things. So there, there is no way you can understand the things by just solely looking at the shadow because it is not the very image of the things. So we are not supposed to practice priesthood in the exact similitude as it is found in the Old Testament. But we know that what is obtainable in the Old Testament is pointing to 
something that is to come. Does that make sense? All right, so it's Apostle Paul that is trying to give us the adaptation principle. And the adaptation principle is um, the spiritual explanation that causes us to have the new eyes and new lenses to see the New Testament in the Old Testament. Once you are armed with the fact that it is a shadow, the second thing you need to be armed with is that it is a shadow of good things to come. That means it's prophetic. Third thing you need to be armed with is that it is not the very image of the things. Can never, with those sacrifices which they offered, year by year, continually make the commerce thereunto perfect. So the sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament did not have the capacity to make the people that attended to them and the people that benefited from them perfect. So there was a deficiency with the actual Old Testament structure. Verse 2. For then will there for then would they not have ceased to be offered. That is, if they were perfect, God would have stopped there and would have been operating that kind of priesthood. And there would be no need for it to cease because that the worshippers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every yeah. So there is a cyclical process that must be undertaken because the sacrifices did not have the adequate spiritual stature to undo sins. So there is a ritual around sins that was done every year. Yes, first of all, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he cometh into this world, he says, Sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. This is a transition that I need to draw our attention to. Are you there with me? Now, the transition that I'm trying to draw your attention to is the key to understanding New Testament priesthood. And this transition has to do with migrating from sacrifice to a living sacrifice. That's what that scripture is. How many of you still remember that in the Old Testament, um, you bring a goat, and the goat is what is sacrificed? So, and the implication of that sacrifice applies to you, even though you were not the one that physically suffered the depravity that the goat was subjected to. But the spiritual effect of the sacrifice of the goat applies to you. Now, what Jesus did when he came to become the ultimate sacrifice was that it was no longer goats that were sacrificed. It became an experience that a man will experience. Do you understand that? Or oh, you didn't get that? So we move, there is a slight movement there from sacrifice to living sacrifice. Now, our New Testament priesthood is founded, as you will see in a moment, is founded and predicated upon the efforts that Jesus has already made. And you need to understand it very well so that when we begin to apply it, as we apply it in the natural, it might look, it might not look powerful. But the consequence it has in the spirit is the reason why we operate that way. Is that, is that clear? Remember that all forms of priesthood in the New Testament is predicated on what Jesus did. Because without the sacrifice of Jesus, we will not even have any priesthood at all. I'm going to show you the infrastructure that was in the temple. When you move from the outer court into the holy place, the first furniture you will see is what is called the brazen altar. All forms of priesthood in that corridor is based on that brazen altar. Uh, those of you that are students of the Bible, that have labored in the Bible for a while, you understand the meaning of brazen, bronze. Bronze means judgment. 
And judgment was what was revealed to Adam in the garden when God told him that in the day that you eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. That's the, posi the position of God's um, justice system. So the judgment that was already hanging over man on the account of that rebellion existed before man committed the infringement. Is that not how law is? You are not, you are not following me. That's how law is. I don't know, um, maybe Barista Kassa will help us. If somebody steals a goat and is confirmed that the person has stolen a goat, what is the likely penalty that is going to receive? Please arm him with a microphone, please. What is the likely penalty that the person, please, when you are coming for, for Bible study, come armed because you can be confronted with a microphone. <laughs> What's the likely penalty that the person is to face if it is confirmed that the person stole a goat? The law that is already there will be applied against the person to the effect that he should either be in prison for a term of years okay. or a, its equivalent of a fine. Okay, if someone breaks into um, a residence yeah. and in, the, in his efforts somebody dies, what's the position of the law about uh, that situation? Okay, that's a capital offense. It's a capital offense. Yes. So straight away, he will, uh, the, the law will require him to also be imprisoned for a term of years. For a term of years, yes. you see. So what I'm trying to say is that the, the position of the law is already established about these crimes. It is not when you commit the crime that the law will be formulated, formulated to accommodate it. Yeah, yeah. The law already has penalties. That, okay, that's what I just wanted you to well. confirm. Thank you. Now, so what we are seeing here... What we are seeing here is that God told Adam that if he eats of that fruit, that the judgment about that level of departure is already captured in the justice system of heaven. So when Jesus came, the major assignment of Jesus was to undo, was to create an escape route for humankind because humankind is already on the bad side of the law. And in order for Jesus to make a way for humankind, uh, judgment had to, he had to receive that judgment. He had to submit to that judgment. So the ultimate purpose of Jesus in his ministry was to offer himself in order to satisfy the claims of divine justice. But the principle of substitution so that you and me can have a way to experience life. So Jesus took our place in judgment so that we can take his place in life. That's the story of the gospel. Now, so all of our priesthood is based on the foundation of what Jesus did. So the, what Jesus did is what is referred to or what is seen as the brazen altar in the holy place. Are you clear? Are you there? So the sacrifice of Jesus is the biggest altar that you can ever find. And our priesthood is based on interacting with that is sacrifice and applying it in various fashions, in various forms. Because in Jesus, sacrifice passes to become a living sacrifice. Sacrifices previously were external things that were given. But the priesthood that Jesus came to manifest, which is the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek, it is human beings that become the sacrifice. You get that? Oh, you didn't get it. Wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he said, sacrifices, offerings, thou wouldest not. It means that the sacrifices that were offered in the Old Testament did not really have the ability to undo the things for which they were offered. So when Jesus came, he said, sacrifices, Bond offerings that you would not, but a body you have prepared for me. The reason why you have given me a body is so that I can become the ultimate sacrifice. Can you see that the sacrifice now has moved from animals and it has moved to a man? You get that? A body. 
That was the reason why Jesus was assigned a body so that he can pay the ultimate price, the ultimate type of sacrifice that will be pleasing in the sight of God that will satisfy the claims of divine justice. Go on. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou hast had no pleasure. Go on. Then said I, lo, I am come in the, in, in the volume of the book, as it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Yeah? Above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither has pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. It means the law did not satisfy God. It only appeased God for a time. And that is why it was repeated, because it was just a means of appeasement. It was not a means of satisfaction. So the claims of divine justice were not satisfied under the law. If you come and bring a bull and sacrifice, it might cover your offense for a time. But uh, that, the implication of that sacrifice and the vocabulary of the blood that is shed will begin to wane in the realm of the spirit until it fully evaporates after a time. So you need to redo that sacrifice again so that you can experience and enjoy the same level of immunity. Are you there? All right, so the reason why the sacrifices had to be cyclical and continuous is because they did not have the ability to satisfy God. Now, this is January, so most of you bought Christmas goat, bought Christmas ram. Please, what is the average cost of Christmas goat? Pastor Chooks, I know you, a goat laid down its life so that you could celebrate. What, what, what was the cost of that goat? Or you're not the one that is in that department. Exactly. Okay, Pastor exactly. Chooks is on the high side. So he, he has people that take care of such issues. I'm talking about someone that can give us the current market price for good right now. Huh? You know, I've not been to the market for a long time. <laughs> Very long time. Okay, somebody's coming up here. I'm hearing 45,000. What? <laughs> 60,000, depending on the size of the stomach. Now, now, okay. Let me ask you a question. If every time you lie, you need to bring a goat to... Consider 2023, how many goats would you have been required to make available? So if you study the book of Galatians, you will find the terminology called the curse of the law. Have you, have you seen that? The curse of the law. You know what the curse of the law is? The requirement for sacrifices, for offenses. Even if you are a billionaire and you are offering one goat of 60,000 naira per, per lie, and maybe the one for fornication might, might be ram. They want, the other day, we were sending somebody with bride price to go and pay for a lady in, in Botswana. It was seven cows. Ah. Ah. Seven cows. What's the, what's, how much does a cow cost? Ah. <laughs> we went to a price. We went to, I, I didn't know that it's only in Nigeria that they price around bride price. Oh. If you try to apply somewhere else, it's, it's an insult. So when they say seven, they mean seven. So are you there? So it means according to Botswana culture, the cost of a man is seven cows. So if the person commits murder and somebody dies, the number of cows you need to bring to atone for that error might be seven cows. How much does one cow go for? You're already seeing that all of us will be in debt. None of us will be rich enough to, to cover 
the level of atonement that is needed in order for us to walk free of the wrath of God. None of us. So that is what we call the cost of the law. The cost of paying for your infringements against God. <laughs> you and me don't have enough resources to pay for it. Exactly. All right, so Jesus is bringing a new kind of priesthood. And the new kind of priesthood that is bringing on the scene is what we call the priesthood of the living sacrifice. <laughs> this priesthood is going to affect you and me. This new type of priesthood. Are you there? Okay, so. Then said he, lo, I am come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. It's, it's because of the inadequacies of the sacrifices of the old Testament that God had to send his son and he gave his son a body so that he can offer himself as a sacrifice that he will, he can accept. Do you still remember the parable of savory meat that I love? That savory meat is Jesus Christ because the sacrifices under the Old Testament did not have enough stature to satisfy God. Are you, are you there? Now, so I want to draw your attention to some matters. Before we leave Hebrews chapter 10, I will still want us to read Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1 before we migrate. Are you still with me? Now, the reason why I'm going this way and showing you the broad concept of priesthood that is practiced in the Levitical order is so that when we zero down and begin to establish how to raise a personal altar. Are you with me? You would have understood the concept of priesthood and it will be easy for you to apply. It will be easy for you to practice it personally. And from experiential perspective, I'll be able to suggest to you the kind of implication that you are going to derive by practicing priesthood in the art of establishing a personal altar. So when we finish talking about a personal altar, then we move to a community or a family altar. Then we move to a national altar. It sustains the same principles, but its application in each case might be just a little different. And uh, when it goes beyond a personal altar, there, is, there are other terminologies we are going to include in describing it, like quorum, quorum. Uh, why is it that on the day of Pentecost there had to be 120? In which other place do you find 120 people that are... Is there any other parallel that carries 120 in the Bible? Oh, for you is no. <laughs> you see, God is a God of patterns. He's a God of science. There's a pattern to the things he does. He doesn't do things one-off because he's prophetic. What he does in the Old Testament is pointing to something he will do in the New Testament. And so there are certain patterns that will be littered around what he does in the Old Testament so that when he begins to do it in the New, you can now say, oh, this is that. This is that. There are parallels in the Bible that will give you insight into what God is fulfilling. Are you there? Okay. So verse number one, it says, for the law... Having a shadow of things to come. The first thing about the law is that it is prophetic. Second thing you need to know is that it is not the very image of the things. And the sacrifices that were offered therein could not make such that came unto it perfect. Now, the reason why I came back here is to show you just the number one point that I raised. It is a shadow of good things. Not just shadow of things to come, but shadow of good things to come. So we are going to look at the Old Testament context, and I'm not so concerned about that. We will see what it points to, and we are going to take our education from the things that all the shadow of um, offerings, all the shadow of sacrifices point to, so that we can understand our position and the implication of those sacrifices within the context of the new covenant. Because that is, that is such that is applicable to you and to 
me. Are you there? You know, we spoke about sacrifices yesterday. And I told you that a sacrifice is something that can be offered to a spirit being that a spirit being will be satisfied about. So if, if at this point I decide to ask you a question, what do you think that if you offer God, God will be satisfied about? Do you have an answer to that question? You know the answer to the question? Moses knew those things. Moses knew the things that God will accept. He knew the things that God will be satisfied about. And if we want to study priesthood, there's no way we can escape studying the life and the ministry of Moses. Do you still remember um, the Passover? The Passover in Egypt? you still remember it? you still remember what was about to happen? It was the angel of death that was about to visit Egypt. It was already concluded. God had given the decree, and the angel of death was mobilized. And then Moses now, because he has a relationship with God, went to consult God, and God gave him a word of wisdom. The word of wisdom that God gave Moses could not stop the decree that had gone forth about the angel of death visiting Egypt. But the word of wisdom that God gave to Moses was able to confuse the angel. He said, take the blood of a ram, put it on your doorpost, put it on the lintel of your house. And the children of Israel did it. When the angel of death came to Israel, he said, ah, somebody help me kill the firstborn here. So he passed over. So when you hear Passover, don't think that they were preferred just because they were Israelites. They were preferred. They were, the angel that was sent to carry out their assignment was confused. Because Moses operated a wisdom that came from a superior realm. So in the eyes of that angel, the sons of Goshen, the firstborn of Goshen, were already sacrificed. That's why he passed over to finish the assignment. He said, somebody help me. Oh. The person has helped me to do this assignment. You see, that's where priesthood comes in. Oh my, you are not here. You are not here. You, you heard what uh, Sister Queen, where is Queen? Do you know people have been asking me questions? That, okay, if, if some, a wizard can raise the dead, hey, then what are we doing? I say, calm down. So, so I went on research. When you were sleeping, <laughs> when you were sleeping yesterday, I was researching. Now, do you realize, so Queen will need to come and confirm this. The only people that your grandfather could raise from the dead were people that witchcraft killed. There is a difference between witchcraft death and normal death. Normal death comes by a decree from God, from the sovereign. Witchcraft death is like, like an armed robber praying on something that is not his own. It's not in the archives, it's not in the records that this person should depart at this time. They use witchcraft to edge the person out. It was not as if an armed robber came to break his skull. It was witchcraft they used to edge him out. And when they edge people out like that, they are, they are prison houses that they can be kept for a time. Their spirit, I mean. It is from those prison houses that the man had wisdom in the priesthood of darkness as to how to set that captive free. So it was not actual resurrection. It's just restoration of what was stolen. Your people called me and said, hey, so wizards can... I uh, say, calm down, calm down, it's okay. But do you, see, do you see how much control that wizard had because of the knowledge of priesthood? Do you realize that you cannot be effective in priesthood if you are ignorant? It doesn't work with priesthood. Spiritual knowledge is the currency with which we do priesthood. Are you still with me? Oh, you are not following me. First Samuel chapter 7, let me clear your doubt. 1 Samuel chapter 7 from verse 3 to 10. 1 Samuel 7 from verse 3 to verse number 10. You don't know how powerful you can become when, if you understand what I want to teach, you know why I'm teaching this with passion, so that the counseling can reduce. The, hi, Jesus I finish teaching, then you see people outside. Ah, that is. 
Some will say, we came from, you know what? It's the knowledge of priesthood that is lacking. That's why the people of God look helpless because they lack spiritual knowledge. There is no way we can master this thing without looking at the ministry of Moses. Exactly. Now, see what Samuel did. And Samuel spake unto all the house of Israel, saying, If ye do return unto the Lord with all your heart and put away the strange gods and asteroids from among you and prepare your heart unto the Lord and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hands of the Philistines. Then the children of Israel did put away Balim and Ashtaroth and served the Lord only. Verse 5, and Samuel said, gather all Israel to Mishpah, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. And they gathered together in Mishpah and drew water and poured it out before the Lord. That is like a libation. And fasted on that day and said, we have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mishpah. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together in Mishpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said unto Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord God for us, that he will save us out of the hands of the Philistines. And Samuel took a suckling lamb. Where did he get that knowledge? Hmm. You know what? You might lack soldiers in your army. You might lack, you might lack economists in your cabinet. Are you there? Don't lack a priest that knows the way of priesthood. These guys were, 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 in, were in national repentance. And the Philistines felt they were vulnerable because they were by the altar of prayer. They said, let's kill them before they recover. <laughs> when the wind of what they had in mind got to Samuel, he took the, the, the child, the child of a lamb. <laughs> Jesus Christ. How did he know that that was what was required? And offered it for a burnt offering, holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel, but the Lord turned that from heaven. That means that offering moved the hand of of God. <laughs> we, we are going to study the Bible. You see, hey, there were battles in Scripture that they were not fought with sword and shield. Are you there? Those days when we were in the office, I don't know what was wrong with our office. If you get a promotion and the next person doesn't get a promotion, in fact, when they promote you, keep quiet. Just pretend as if. <laughs> let, no, <laughs> let nobody know because it is, it's a serious problem. And people are attacking people, not just with words, so spiritually. You will see somebody after work on Friday, before Monday, he has died. And somebody would think that it is his certificate from Benin State University that he made first class that will qualify him to work in such a place. Your certificate can give you access to the place, but to survive the place, you will need something else. So what I'm saying is that uh, Moses helped us with all the details of how to appease God. I need to give us an overview of the book of Leviticus. I think I've done that before. Just to aid understanding. All right? Yes, it is good for us to go into scriptures, single scriptures, and plot the mind of God out by bringing scriptures together. That's good. But once and again, we need to look at the general overview so that you can understand the concept of what God is actually doing within the pages of the Bible. 
Now, the idea of the book of Leviticus was that God is a holy God. And man is a sinful man. What, how can a holy God deal with sinful man? His nature of holiness will make him judge sinful man, so there is no possibility of sinful man, sinful man doing business with the holy God. Hence, the need for priesthood. Moses was able to gain insight into all the kinds of sacrifices that are needed to appease God so that humankind can have dealings with a holy God. So by the time we go into the book of Leviticus, which I would like you to go in your personal time, because I've already gone there, so let me tell you what is there. The first thing you'll find in the book of Leviticus are the three, five, sorry, five offerings that God has approved. So Moses was able to journey into the heart of God and he was able to distill five types of offerings that can appease God, that can satisfy God. Exactly. And the objective of these offerings is to bring us to a point where we can have a relationship with God. Because God knows that if we can relate with him, then there is nothing that is around our human existence that is omnipotence, that is, 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 is grace and wisdom will not swallow up. The thing is, create a way, let us relate with God. And if that's what you want, you will need to offer elaborate sacrifices because of the kind of being that God is. He is a holy God. So in the book of Leviticus, we have five types of sacrifices. Do you still remember the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 1? It says the, holy, the Old Testament, the law, the things we find in the Old Covenant, there are what? A shadow of what? Of good things to come. So what we are trying to do is that we pick the thing in the Old Testament and then we try to find what it is pointing to in the New Testament. If it is a shadow of things to come, it means it's prophetic and it's talking about something that God will do in another dispensation. Since we no longer live under the Old Covenant, we need to find the application of those things that are captured in the Old and their representation within the context of the New. Those are the articles that forms the substance of our priesthood. Basically. That's, are you still here? So the first type of offering that is, was ordered by God, commanded by God, is what we call the sin offering. The sin offering. You know, I told you that man has a problem, and the problem that man has is a sin problem, and God happens to be a holy God. So if sinful man is going to do business with a holy God, God has prescribed that the way he will be appeased is through the sin offering. And if you turn your Bible to the book of 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, please, chapter 5. Is there anybody there in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5? 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. Can we do 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 to 21? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning from verse 18 to verse 21. And what we are trying to see from the lens of the New Testament is the representation of the sin offering. You cannot carry sin around and do business with the Holy Ghost. If we want to raise up righteous altars and establish memorials that will perpetually move the hand of God, platforms of covenant that we can use to force God's hand to move, then you will do well to understand the applications and the New Testament representations of offerings that God commanded by himself. Okay. And all things are of God who had reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. 
to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had committed unto us the word or the ministry of reconciliation. Now, now and then we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. This is Paul crying out to his generation. He said this voice of Christ, the spirit of Christ is speaking through us and is addressing our generation. What is the spirit of Christ saying? Be ye reconciled to God. So God reconciled us to God and God has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. That means we are the one that is going to bridge the gap to bring a lost world back into alignment with a loving God. Verse 21 is my emphasis. For he has made him sin for us. I'm talking about the sin offering from New Testament perspective. The reason the, 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 the pedestal upon which our ministry of reconciliation is established is that Jesus himself is the sin offering. For the Bible says that he had made him to be seen for us who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. But God, in judgment, put him in the place of sin. And that was uh, the principle of substitution that was at work. So he knew no sin, that he might be made, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. I, I, I would like you to see the beauty of substitution. The beauty of substitution. God made him that knew no sin to become sin so that you and I will become the righteousness of God in him. So if you have received Jesus into your life, the sacrifice of the sin offering has been offered in your stead. The application of that sacrifice has worked his goodwill in your life such that your new status in the new covenant is that you are the righteousness of God in him. That was only possible because God made him that knew no sin. He made him sin so that you can become what? The righteousness of God in him. I hope you know this righteousness is not a function of our works. This righteousness is a function of Christ. Christ has become our righteousness. Christ is the one that paid the price in order for us to have the stature of righteousness. And what it means to be righteous is the kind of thing that a, a judge declares in court after a case has come to the head and he's, he, he, what's that hammer? What's the name of that hammer? What? Gavel. All right, so he, he hits it and he says, this man, Faye be has been discharged and acquitted. She has been declared righteous. Now, after that declaration that the judge gave, even if she is the culprit, it is no longer so in the eyes of the law. How the law sees is according to what was decreed. And the law has said that she is declared righteous. Your status of righteousness within the context of the New Testament and the new covenant is not a function of what you did. It's a function of what Jesus did. It's not one of the things you did in order to qualify for. It's one of the things that was given to you as a gift. So the Bible says, how much more they that have received the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. The reason why it's called the gift of righteousness is because you do not do anything to earn it. It is Christ that has become your Righteousness. Not that Christ's righteousness became your righteousness, but Christ as a person is the one that has become your righteousness. I know you don't understand that. Okay, how many of you here have an account with Zenith Bank? All right. When you use your ATM, Zenith ATM, on a Zenith Bank ATM machine, when you slot it in, the ATM machine will type your name out, say, Arome. 
Are you there? So it will accept me because I am Aram. If I give my ATM card to Philip B and it goes to a Zenith ATM machine, when he slots it in, the ATM machine will say Aram. It means B will be accepted because in the eyes of the machine, it is Aram. So you are going to be accepted because in the eyes of the justice system of heaven, it is Jesus. That's why we pray in his name, not in your own name. Do you get that? We come by his blood. It is his identity we take when we are interacting with heaven because it is him that God has accepted. Do you see, get it? Now, it's not a function of... <laughs> Uh, you did, the fundamentals of righteousness. You know, I, how many of you have listened to the message I taught? I taught on the gifts of God, the gifts of God. The first gift that I spoke about is the gift of righteousness. And it's given to us in installment as a gift, not as something you pay for, but as something that is imputed unto you. That's something that is declared so to you, just like a, a judge in court declare somebody righteous. Do you get that? In our own case, we're actually guilty. But when the court proceedings came to a head, God, because of Jesus, declared us righteous. Now, when Satan comes your way, one of the things he will do is that he will still show you your state of sin. He will still, he, you know, Satan goes around with a camera, with Canon. Do you know Canon camera? And when you wanted to steal meat from the pot, it took, <laughs> it took a shot. Are you still with me? You went on a course to Calabar. Your, your wife was not there. When you wanted to lay hold on that damsel, it <laughs> Satan is going to use that picture to hunt you. You use it to play tricks with your mind. But you see, if you understand justice, the power of an evidence is only, is only effective before judgment is passed. Are you there? But the thing about the devil is that he, even though judgment has been passed and you have been declared righteous, Satan will still bring the picture and show you evidence that you stole that meat. Now, the point is this. If you are not convinced that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, Satan through deception can get you into depression. You will no longer trust your salvation. Are you there? The evidence is no longer important if the case has finished and the judge has given a verdict. Please help me preach to your neighbor. Your, your neighbor is not aware. Tell your neighbor that that evidence Satan is bringing against you is no longer valid. We have something superior to the evidence now, which is the position of justice. We have been declared righteous. So when Satan comes with the pictures, refer him to the judgment. Huh? All right, so that's the first offering. It's called the sin offering. We need to finish all the offerings, basic offerings. When we finish the basic offerings, I will take you deeper into the book of Leviticus, and then we are going to see three things. Are you still with me? It's after those three things that, in fact, it will take this whole week. So at the end of the day, because every Sunday we will practice what we are teaching by praying some prayers and we expect that results will begin to show up before Monday. Yes, after praying those prayers. Then next week, I will now start with establishing personal altars. When we started that course, some of the terminologies we are defining, the things we are explaining, you will see where it fits in that arrangement. It will be easy for you to comprehend. And the extent to which you gain mastery of moving the hand of God will be dependent on some factors that we are going to talk about. Hallelujah. The second offering in the book of Leviticus is what we call the trespass offering. The trespass offering. To cut the long story short, please come with me to the book of Colossians chapter 1 verse 14 and Ephesians chapter 1 verse 
17. Colossians chapter 1, verse 14. Trespass offering. You offer a trespass offering when you commit an infringement on the law. If you commit an infringement on the law in the Old Testament, you offer a trespass offering. You must have seen in the presentation that the sin offering is the payment for our redemption. The sin offering is a payment for our redemption. But the trespass offering is offered in order for us, for our fellowship with God to be restored. There were capital offenses that someone could commit, and that person will be excommunicated from the camp of Israel. You are considered an outcast. You are no longer living under our laws. Are you there? But there are several restitutions that can be made to restore the person and restore his status in the kingdom. Now, the Bible says in Jesus we have redemption through his blood. That's the sin offering. Is that clear? Even the remission or the forgiveness of sins. There are two things that the blood of Jesus secures for us. It secures redemption, and it also secures the forgiveness of sin. So this is the basis of the trespass offering. You might still need to resort to the blood if you have committed an infringement against the laws of God. And when you commit an infringement against the laws of God, the Holy Spirit, who happens to be the living Christ that is upon your heart, is going to express his displeasure. When you notice the displeasure of the Spirit of God, what you do is that you offer a trespass offering so that you, there can be a restoration of your fellowship with the Spirit of God. So in the blood of Jesus, we have redemption and we have what? The forgiveness of sin. That's the trespass offering. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 17, if you have it, put it on the screen. And the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you... Uh, 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 uh. Wow, is that 1, verse 17? Hey, now let, give me a moment. Let me find out. No need for a moment. We are wasting time. It's either 1 verse 17 or 2 verse 17 or 3 verse 17 or 4 verse 17. <laughs> it's a support scripture to reveal that the same, the same pathway through which our redemption was secured is the same pathway that provides a platform for us to experience forgiveness. So if you say, I am saved by the blood of Jesus, you are theologically right. If you say, I am forgiven because of the blood of Jesus, you are theologically right. And when you are theologically right, it means that you are entitled to an experience of God if you exercise your faith in standing biblical truth. So if I have a challenge with the Holy Ghost because I've committed an infringement against his laws, I, I am not an outcast. I can still find my way into fellowship by taking advantage of the blood of Jesus. Now, but this is the balance that I want to add to that. The fact that we have forgiveness as one of the blessings that is available to us in New Covenant does not mean that we should abuse uh, the ministry of the blood of Jesus. What do I mean by abuse? All right, come with me to the book of Romans. Let me just strike the balance. If I strike the balance and you get it, then um, we can move on. In Romans chapter 6, verse 1, the Bible says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So this is somebody that is a Christian that knows that there is forgiveness in Christ Jesus. He wants to continue in sin so that he can take advantage of the grace that abounds in God wherewith he forgives those that are offenders. Now, so if you go this way, what you are doing is that you are abusing grace. Because you will notice that Paul gave a response to the question that he asked and he said, God forbid. But the question is this, what if what happens to a believer that decides to abuse grace? I've told you before, there are eight consequences. And it's not for this lecture. That's number one. Then number two, it's also possible for you to receive the grace of God in vain. Grace is supposed to be 
a facility through which we can obtain pardon. Grace is also supposed to be a facility through which we can obtain empowerment. Many of you here have a calling on your life. Some of you are aware of it, but you have not yet, you are not even willing to fulfill it. And I don't want to go into details. You are not even willing to fulfill it. The grace has been on your life, but you have, the grace has not been put to work because you have not given the grace an opportunity to energize you to perform that line of service in the kingdom of God. I don't want to go into all of that. But I've told you, now that you have discovered that we have something called forgiveness, Paul is saying, let us not continue in sin so that the grace of forgiveness might abound. It means that if you are living in sin after that you have been redeemed, your Christian life is not accurate. How many of you have been to the riverside? Maybe in your local government, your, in your village, there's, there's, there's a water body. And you see sometimes, especially if there are waves, some fish will, will glide on the waves and then the waves will push it inland and recede. If that fish is a normal fish, you will find the fish jumping, trying to touch water again to go back into its habitat. Are you there? But if you find fish putting on face cap with dark bones and is there with, 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 um, with an umbrella singing, we wish you a Merry Christmas. Just know that you have died. You are not. <laughs> Why am I using this example? Everyone that has the spirit of Christ in him that is born again, when they enter into sin unknowingly, you will find them running back to seek repentance with God and realignment with God. When you find a believer that is camping in sin and just saying glory, <laughs> he is abnormal. He is he's wicked. He's strange. May God help us in Jesus' mighty name. Don't even associate. The Bible says you should not associate with it. He has discovered a, a technology that is not in Christ. Don't get it wrong, sin has the capacity to deceive. It will, it will deceive you. And the way you know someone that has been deceived by sin is that the person becomes comfortable in sin. And most of the time, they become comfortable because they have realized that there is a grace for forgiveness. So Paul is saying, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. Are you there? If you are going to make spiritual progress, you are going to advance with God, you are going to move with the Holy Ghost and grow in the things of the Spirit, you will need to have a decision about sin. And the decision that I have made is that sin will not have dominion over me. So are you seeing that it's a personal decision? For me, somebody else, it might have dominion, but for me, it will not have dominion over me. Are you there? Can you see that sin is a dominating entity? Sin wants to rule. Sin wants to reign. But you see, the power that is in the grace of God that makes forgiveness available, that power is superior to the power of sin. So we will therefore not continue in sin that grace may abound, but will take advantage of, of grace as empowerment to live about sin. So our grace is not... It's not the example of Samson and Delilah. Grace is the example of Joseph and Potiphar's wife. Okay, let's go back. Are you there? So when there's an infringement against the law, you can offer the trespass offering. Okay, we need to go to the bond offering. The bond offering. Can you see that the sin offering... We are enjoying the sin offering as redemption. We are enjoying the trespass offering as forgiveness. Can you see that at this level in the New Testament is the, is the economy of the living sacrifice? It's no longer a bull that we are giving, but the implication of the sacrifice is experienced. The implication of the sacrifice can be received. The implication of the sacrifice determines the quality of life that you live. 
Now, so we have the burnt offering. And the example of the burnt offering is what we have in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14, if you have it. It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot unto God. So he offered himself without spot. He offered himself wholly unto God. Now, because Jesus, are you with me? I say, are you with me? Because Jesus offered himself as a burnt offering, holy. After Jesus died, there was nothing good in him that someone could pick because he used all of him to pay for all of us. The implication of Jesus offering himself as a burnt offering on our own lives, I need to show you from the Bible. Because your priesthood begins from becoming accurate to these basic demands of God. In the book of, hallelujah, Romans chapter 12, are you there? Begin from verse 1. I will show you the implication of the bond offering. Jesus gave a bond offering, and he will demand a bond offering from you. He gave his blood for redemption, gave his blood for forgiveness, but he said, do not continue in sin so that grace may abound. Are you there? Now he's given a burnt offering. And the implication of the burnt offering is the book of Romans chapter 12 and Romans chapter 6. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves, your bodies, as a living sacrifice. That is consecration. Consecration, your consecration to God is supposed to be in response to the fact that the offering Jesus offered that procured your salvation was an absolute burnt offering. There was no part that was left that was still, everything was consumed in the sacrifice that had the capacity to secure your salvation. So in response to that kind of sacrifice, God is demanding consecration from you. I need to show you the responsibilities you need to bear as a priest. In order for you to function as a priest, you will find out this word called holiness. You will stumble on it again and again and again. Do you still remember the attire of the priest in the Old Testament? How many of you still remember it? The Levite has six garments. The priest that will minister in the holy place, sorry, sorry, the Levite has three garments. The priest that will minister in the holy place has six garments. And the high priest that will minister in the holy of holies has nine garments. Are you there? And the last garment is when you put the mitre, then is that crown, that crown. There is a crown. How many of you still remember how a bishop looks? A bishop, maybe in the Catholic Church. There's a crown that they wear. That crown is called the crown of glory because on that crown is holiness unto the Lord. Now, as you begin to function in priesthood, God is not just concerned about the sacrifices you offer. He is concerned about the offerer. I'm going to show you three requirements for a priesthood in the book of Le Leviticus. And as we study it, you will discover that what will make your prayer potent is not your prayer. What will make it potent is your lifestyle. Because God will first accept you before he will accept your offering. So if God rejects you, there's no way God can accept your offering. If God should cast you away, there is no way he can accept your offer. He will accept you first before he will accept your offer. You know all of us can pray, but God's response to each and every one of us it will never be the same. There are parameters that determine whose voice is honored in the chambers of God. One of these parameters is determined by your level of consecration. 
your level of consecration is supposed to be the resultant effect of your salvation. The next thing you should do after your salvation is that you consecrate yourself to serve the will of God. So I want to say this quickly. A forgiving sinner is different from a consecrated believer. Let me say it again. A forgiving sinner is different from a consecrated believer. It is when you come to the point where you begin to consider consecrating yourself, God now begins to call you reasonable. Every other believer that has not come to the point of consecration is unreasonable. So when the person is bringing a sacrifice to God, what God is saying about him is that <laughs> you're unreasonable. Unreasonable because you don't understand the implication of the bond sacrifice of his son. The resultant effect of that bond sacrifice is the demand for your own consecration. A believer will be going around in circles. He will not ex experience real victory if there are aspects of his life that he has not surrendered under the influence of the government of God. All right, let's go back to the scripture. He said, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, you are not following. Are you following? Yes. Now, I want you to understand that the sin offering is compulsory for every Israelite. The trespass offering is compulsory for every Israelite. But the three other offerings are voluntary. You will decide to choose or not. So you will notice the, the tone of Paul is beseech, he's begging. Do you realize that it's possible for a believer to be born again and he has nothing to do with holiness, but his salvation is intact? It is possible for you to live like that. So Paul is saying, I beseech you. I plead with you. That you offer your, your, by the mercies of God, in fact, he pleads by the mercies of God, to offer, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He says that you, you become reasonable after you begin to consider to consecrating yourself to serve the will of God. Um, who is from Kwande? Kwande local government. Yes, so give us uh, the list. The list, marriage list. Kwande list. If somebody wants to marry somebody, a lady from Kwande, can you give us the highlights, powerful items that will be on that list? Please equip mommy with a microphone. See mommy there. Don't give young people. They don't know this thing. Give. Oh, my God. Okay. If somebody is coming to Kwande, wants to take a bride from Kwande, what are the requirements, the highlights, things that must be on the list? Please. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The first thing is a pig. Now, <laughs> how many of you know where they sell pig here? You see? Oh, you know. Ah, you're up to date. You're so we don't even know where they sell it. <laughs> That's how strange that list is. There are items on it that you don't know which market they buy. The first thing is a pig, yes? The second thing is salt. Are you saying that we cannot negotiate the pig out? No. No, it's not. It's not negotiable. <laughs> it has been judged. <laughs> <laughs> it has been judged. <laughs> OK, you bring a sword. Palm oil. Salt, salt, salt. Okay, mm. salt. A bag of salt. M many bags. Oh, bags of yeah. salt. Yes. Okay. All right. Ah, Palm seven, oil. Seven bags of salt. Palm oil. Do you, do you, do you have a quantity? Ten, twelve, eight. Uh -uh. Depending on the, Depending. the leniency of the family. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Now, please take note, young men, especially those that are not. <laughs> the minimum number of kegs, palm oil kegs, is seven. But in, in those days, 
When there is no leniency, think of 14. That's what. Yes, and salt, seven bags. Yes, any other constant item on the list? Maggi. Okay. Onions. Onions. That is all for the women. There are other things for the men. Okay, so, so these are basic features you will find on the bridal list of a damsel from Kwande. Mommy, thank you. Now, imagine that someone labors, just like I don't know where they sell pig now. Because I want to get married, I move, I move to Buruku, I move to their market square, and I locate a pig. It means I'm discovering things that I should not normally know because I want to get married. After gathering all these things, and you make payment, and they finish the traditional marriage, and give you the damsel. That's when you will discover that there's something you did not buy. And that is her love. You can finish paying for the bride price and she comes into your house and refuses to love you. There's nothing you can do about it. But the bride, are you there? Are you following? Huh. Are you? <laughs> are you following? But the Bible is saying, eh? If she refuses to love you after what you have paid, she's not reasonable. So the situation in the book of Romans chapter 12 is that Jesus paid your bride price and the cost was the price of his blood. The only way you can register the fact that you are reasonable. The one he paid is more than the least in Kwande. The way to register the fact that you are reasonable is that you consecrate. You are not living for yourself anymore. You want to live for him. This is an indication of the fact that I have become reasonable. Do you see that I told you that God will accept you first before he accepts your sacrifice? If we judge from these standards, how many believers are reasonable? So I didn't want us to go into a priesthood how to set up altars when we are living in rebellion to God. He's not going to strike any cord anywhere. Because the way of the priest, I will show you now the scripture I read yesterday. I read the scripture yesterday, um, First Peter chapter, about priesthood in the New Testament. I'm going to show you the progression. That verse 5 did not just come out of the air. There were other verses that were there present before verse 5. And you will see admonitions about purity, admonitions about integrity and sincerity, admonitions about holiness before he begins to speak about priesthood. The difference between Romans chapter 12 and Romans chapter 6 is the same subject of consecration. But the goal of consecration in Romans chapter 12 is that it is the pathway through which you can secure the will of God. How many of you I've been laboring to find the will of, of God on many matters. The reason why it is difficult, eh? consecration. When you consecrate yourself to serve God's will, it will be easier for you to access what is on his mind, what is on his heart. The goal of consecration, from the perspective of Romans chapter 12, is what? It's knowing the will of God. All right, I need to take you to Romans chapter 6. I don't have time to do all the analysis in this scripture, but I believe the, script, the scripture is self-explanatory. He said, I beseech you, brethren, by the message of God, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable act of service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that he may prove that which is good, that, that which is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I told you that the goal of consecration in Romans chapter 12 is that it affords us the opportunity to be able to access the will of God. Consecrated people don't struggle to know God's mind. Don't struggle. They don't struggle. God is willing to let them into the secret of his will. They don't struggle. If you want your priesthood to be powerful, 
you must present yourself a reasonable person before God. Is that clear? Now, so if you go to the book of Romans chapter 6, which is another chapter of the Bible that speaks about consecration, we can begin our reading from verse 18. Romans 6 verse 18. In Romans 6 verse 18, the Bible shows us a contrast and a comparison. Now, so stay, stay with me. Let us study. It said, being made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. Now, so our, our preoccupation before we gave our life to Christ was that we're in bondage to sin. Now that we have been freed from sin, we are still in bondage. But now we're in bondage to righteousness. I didn't see the transition from bondage to sin. God knows that you need to be in bondage to something. You must be bound by something. Previously, sin was the object of our bondage, but now righteousness becomes the object of our bondage. So when you are living righteous, you feel peace with yourself. Are you there? But the moment you sin, you feel bad because your new master is called what? Righteousness. So it is natural, it is normal for you to operate in righteousness. It is abnormal, therefore, for you to operate in sin. Meanwhile, those days, it was normal for you to operate in sin. It was abnormal. If people see you with Bible, your group of friends say, ah. <laughs> Do you understand? So there's a new creation already from sin to righteousness. Okay, next verse. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as ye have yielded your members servants to uncleanliness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members as servants of righteousness unto holiness. Can you see that the goal of consecration from Romans chapter 6 is holy living? Where is that sound coming from? Huh? Something's happening there. Is a man up there? Now, those of you up there, all of you, after service, come to my office, all of you. Now, listen. Listen. It says that when we were still in sin, the story of our lives was that we lived in the infirmity of our flesh, We yielded our members as servants to uncleanliness from one level of iniquity to an another level of iniquity. As we gain mileage in iniquity, that's how our center of gravity is gratified. But you see, now that we have come into Christ Jesus, we yield our members as servants of righteousness unto holiness. So I need to explain to us what is the difference between Righteousness and holiness. Who can help me with that? Okay, let me not trouble you. Righteousness is our new nature. Holiness is our new lifestyle. That's how we live. We live a life that is separated unto God. Our old nature was the nature of sin. That sin that is singular, is a nature. Sins with plural is a lifestyle. So it is a nature of sin and a lifestyle of sins. You get it? Now it is a nature of righteousness and a lifestyle of holiness. Yes, go on, next verse. For when we were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. 21. What fruit had you then in those things whereof you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. So this is the equation. From sin, the nature of sin, to iniquity unto iniquity, or from sin to sins, then unto death. You get it? Next verse. But now being made free from sin, you became servants of God. 
and you have your fruit unto holiness, and the end is everlasting life. Now, it means this pathway, in this pathway, your, your inheritance in the heavenlies is guaranteed. So this is the pathway from righteousness unto holiness and into everlasting life. It's a guarantee. Meanwhile, the other one is from sin to sins into death. Not just physical death, but eternal death. But now, from righteousness into holiness and into what? So in the book of Romans, the goal of consecration is to access the will of God. And the will of God is the meaning of your life upon the face of the earth. It was when I discovered the will of God that it was not God's will for me to be a lecturer, but God's will for me to lecture the scriptures. So I gave myself to the scriptures because I knew that this was the assignment the Lord had for me. Do you know that in the practice of teaching this Bible, I have stood before kings. Do you know, just, I've stood before kings. At least Philip, everywhere, almost everywhere I've gone, Philip has, is the, he has accompanied me. There are things we can't say on this pulpit, places we have been, that we'll never say here. We'll never say here, because it's not about us. The reason why we were given those opportunities was because of the grace of God. So if there's anybody to be celebrated, it is the Lord Jesus that gave us the privilege. It's not something to boast about because it was not by power. It was not by might. It was by God's grace. So if there's anyone that should glory, the glory should go back to the one that gives the grace. That's why we are not going to say it publicly. But, but just obeying the will of God has made us stand before kings. Not just to stand there as a privilege. We came to counsel with kings. Kings were desperate to know what the Lord has put on our lips. And the only reason why we're standing there was because of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why not, why not, why not stay in your lane? There is greatness. There is greatness in the kingdom of God. And in the kingdom, it is your service that is your access to greatness. In fact, service is greatness. That's what Jesus taught. As I serve the body of Christ, teaching the Bible, building capacity among the believers, then God begins to promote me. Such promotion that man cannot give me. Don't run away from kingdom service because that is the sure path to greatness. Your greatness will not come from outside. It will come from within you. It will come from the investment that God has made on your life. When I finished my first degree, God said, you will not go to formal school again. And that was a blow on me because I love knowledge. I want to get knowledge. I want to acquire knowledge. And when we now, I started teaching and preaching here, our members were lecturers in BSU that were influential. They were the ones that came to me and said, why not just add another degree? I said, that's a good idea. The day the admission came out, that's where I lost my peace. And I labored for one month before the peace came back. The fact that you have people that can influence your admission. Baba gave you a, an instruction. Are you there? By now, I think I should have been, been a professor now. An old one, self, not just a new one. Because of the desire I had for knowledge. So God took that away from me and showed me his will. It was this Bible. So I studied it. I studied it back and front. I studied it for many years. Many years. If you know, it was from my pool of study I stood up to come and teach you today. If you know how many books I've consulted, how many references I've read, I've journeyed into the thoughts of many theologians on the subject of priesthood. Even though the teaching anointing is good, you, you think what I'm doing is natural. No, what I dispense, you will get it through study. <laughs> if I want to preach a good sermon, I need four days. 
four days of research. Four days of research. Three days of research and one day to speak in tongues. After I finish the research, then I now speak in tongues. Then the thing will now become flesh. I have served God in this way. And I've seen how God will bring a humble dispenser of truth from the backside of the wilderness in Makodi and take him to stand among the nations. Greatness is in service. So a man that is consecrated unto God, it will be easy for him to know the mind of God. And the man that is consecrated unto God, it will be easy for him to walk the walk of holiness. That will become what will be most natural to him. In order for you to commit sin, to be a work of the flesh, it means hard labor because you need to violate your conscience, violate the promptings of the Holy Ghost, violate the cry of the Holy Ghost. You need to put in a lot of effort in order for you to live, to walk in sin, to produce unrighteousness. Because it will be a consecrated man finds it easy to walk the walk of holiness. Because he's first of all constituted with the nature of righteousness, and that nature of righteousness will compel him. Oh my God. So the first thing I do in the morning when I wake up, most of the time I wake up with a song in my spirit. That is one of the signs that my spirit did not sleep. Sorry, there are five sacrifices. We just did three. We still need to do the peace offering, which is very critical. And we need to do the meat offering, which is also very critical. Because the peace offering is going to be the barometer through which you navigate in the spirit realm. That barometer is critical. It's the, it's the thermometer that shows you the measurements where you are doing your transactions with God. Are you there? I want us to make a commitment to God this 2024. That the description of my life will not be captured in sins and trespasses but it will be captured in loyalty to the Holy Ghost, loyalty to Jesus, and a work of holiness that is made possible by the cross. Are you there? Let the desire to work with you be so intense that it will best every other mundane desire that locks upon my soul. A man that is going to walk the walk of holiness is such a man that desires God above everything else. The reason why the proposal to cut corners, the proposal to sin, the proposal to violate God becomes interesting is because there is something in your heart that holds a higher place than God. The moment God becomes the idol in your heart, the highest island in your heart, it will be easy for you to seek him out, to walk with him. You become sensitive to him. What he says will matter to you. How his spirit feels will matter to you. Don't get it wrong. You are not a priest if you have not accepted the work of holiness. Because for all priests, there is a culture and it's the culture of holiness. The latitude of the temple is measured according to holiness. We have an outer court. We have the holy place. And then we have the holy of holies. If you are walking from outside into inside, then your holiness level will begin to shine brighter and brighter and brighter so that you can stand and do business with the living God. The sacrifices of Jesus has already implicated us. He gave a burnt offering so that you can live a consecrated life. He gave a sin offering so that you can experience redemption. The potential of his blood supersedes what was required to pay for your redemption. So he still has extra capacity which can be used for the forgiveness of sins. If you see the protocol from sin into redemption, from redemption you have forgiveness and then there is a demand for you to walk the walk of holiness and to access the mind of God and the will of God. It's already showing you a graph. God is taking you from the land of sin and incorporating you into his kingdom and he's insisting on the work of holiness as you progress. 
Before you give God an offering, you must be sure that God can accept your person. I remember those days when I was much younger in marriage. It was my preoccupation, my intention to always prove to my wife that I was right. And I had the cerebral power to achieve that, even if I'm wrong. My mother said, if you had read law, we would have, we would have had to pack from this house and leave you. Because even as a child, I could argue. So they, they guided my hands away from law because they knew that the, the terrorism would begin from the house. They, they guided my hands. Are you, are you there? So it was my preoccupation to prove to my wife that I am right. Until I started knowing God deeply. Then I discovered that it was not just outright sin that was filthy in the eyes of God. It was also self, the ways of men. And that was more detest, detestful in his sight. Ah! Hey, I thought I was, I, I scored good records until I started going close. Then I, I knew I needed more cleansing than any man. Oh my. It is not the only, only the unbeliever that should repent to. As you go close to God, again and again, you will repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. I had to repent of, of very, very bitter anger. I had to repent of and, and lay down for his surgery to take it out. As I speak to you, I know that uh, pride has not been dealt with 100% in my life. I know it. But where it is now, it will not obstruct the will of God. <laughs> and God begins to make deliberate investments in our lives so that we look like him more and more. That is when we become qualified to transact with him. There was a man that Abraham became that made it possible for him to transact with God. He entered titles in the spirit. He became the friend of God. He became the father of faith. And he became the father of many nations. Oh my God. There is a kind of man that can transact with God. I want to be that kind of man. The Bible says that by faith, Abel, he offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. By which he received witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts by which even when he was dead, he yet speaketh. He created the priesthood that outlived him. And the voice of his altar spoke even while he was dead. That's the man I want to be. I want to know the ways of God. I want to know it so much that I can climb my altars and cut a covenant in the spirit that will still be speaking. Years after I have left here. There are things that devil, the Satan will not be able to do upon the face of the earth because I caught a covenant with God. The Bible gave us a thesis proposal in the book of Hebrews, sorry, Romans chapter 4. He said what? Give me Romans chapter 4 as, as we close. Romans 4 verse 1. He said, what shall we say that Abraham, our father, as pertaining to the flesh, had found? This, this is a proposal. It's, it's a research proposal. What can we say that he found? What can we say he found? The Jews claim him to be their ancestor. Christians claim him to be their ancestor. Muslims claim him to be their father. What did he find? What kind of man is this? What kind of stature is this? If you study the book of Galatians, you, will be, you understand that redemption began with Abraham. Have you studied Galatians chapter 3? Do you realize that the moment you become born again, your designation is that you are a son, a child of Abraham. So the question is, what did God do with him? What did he find? How did he become such a man that God could not do without him? There were generations he showed mercy, not because of them, not because of their righteousness, but because of his servant, Abraham. Moses came into ministry and he was given a role. 
and God cleared his doubts quickly. See, it's because of my servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I remembered my covenant with them. That's why I called you. It means that your calling is inconsequential. It's, it resulted from something, an intercourse that is deeper than your age. So be careful. It is their cry that has made me choose you. You are standing on the foundation of their acceptance before me. How are men like that formed? Can we cry? I want to have a name in heaven. Give me a name in heaven. He said, Jesus, I know. Paul, I know. Your name has not yet been registered in the courts of God. Hey, somebody needs to cry. Because this January, this January, we want to travel, we want to trespass into the Holy of Holies and look in the eyes of him that sits between the cherubims. He said, because of a maker, I will bring rain. <laughs> because of Solomon, I will bring deliverance. Because of Philip, I will raise messengers like him in generations to come. What can your name open? What can your name open in the realm of the spirit? I know him that he will offer, it will, he will order his descendants after me to serve the living God. I know him. Hey. Hey. There is something that gives you an identity. It gives you a placement such that when you call, he can move half of heaven to attend to your petition. We are not going into 2024 with blindness. We are going to invoke a capacity of grace. Hey, make me that man of stature, that man that you will look at and you will stay your hand of judgment over a nation over a territory you will look at my prayers no matter how feeble they may be and that will become the reason why you turn back the reckless wickedness that is about to play out in his territory Give me a name in heaven. Juvelai Kopami. Escovela Nino Mokoria. Breco si Kopama Laitami. Escobo no Horokoria Brasketa Mila Ato. Yela Lobo Seketami. Can you cast away? the filthiness, cast away the compromise, cast away the sin, cast away the unrighteousness. This is the day of the Puritans, the day of the Nazarites, men that are sold out to the will of God. Hey!
Vámonos, hijo fresco, afá. En todo vos sacha y la hijo grande, mi nada. Eso se la tranque la bocola va a Y la baba rojo sale la liga sale. Esa manda va a morir, va a abrir a la babosa. De coro vos sacha, lea. Mante de derecho, coro vos sacha. Y a la 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 Cavalata cusca tamina casca topria la babonde. Empregate la basamena cante broke va la sala. Y cavalaba santoria, y cusque de moncoria. Rala mamma maya. Y robo bobo bossi calaya. Amaye que quería. Y sobre brosque la grande maboria. Alaba bosse. Y robo bobo bossi. Give me a name in heaven. In the name of Jesus. Romans chapter 16, verse 1. I commend you unto Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is a centria, that you receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, that he assist her in whatsoever business she has need of you, for she has been a succorer of many and myself also. Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers in Christ Jesus, who gave for my life, who have for my life laid down their own necks unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles. Likewise, greet the church which is in their house. Salute my well-beloved Epenit Epenitus, who is the first fruits of Christ in Asia. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us, and Paul, comes up with a list, a list of men that should be greeted, of Aquila, Priscilla, of Apelles. The question is, will they greet you? Will they send a message that greet, greet Tony, greet Tony? The things for which the greetings should be sent were mentioned. It says, salute Andronicus and Junior. My kinsmen, I hope you know it is easy to preach to the world, difficult to preach to your family. Andronicus and Junior, they were, they were from his own family. And what, what is their identity? My fellow prisoners, that's, that's, that's their mark. Who were of note among the apostles. And Junior is female. Those of you that claim that <laughs> females cannot be apostles. They were worthy of note among the apostles. They were fellow prisoners. They were also in Christ before Paul. Will they greet you? These are people whose names are in heaven. As they are coming, they will greet them. and say, ah, you bestowed much labor on the house of God. I want to have a name in heaven. I want to receive salutations from heaven. I want to be known in heaven. I want greetings, greetings to come. Greetings are starting my service in the house of God. Oh, somebody cried to him. I want to be greeted. I want to be remembered. I want to have a name in the house of God. 